Good evening and welcome back to Cecilia. Um, this week's Sunday shout out goes to none other than our great authoress herself, Frances Burney, um, whose birthday was yesterday. Happy birthday, Miss Burney. Thank you for your wonderful writing. Um, I'm going to read the next two chapters actually because the first one is very short um, and I should give the disclaimer that if I am called away uh, yes, interesting, interesting. I have had a visitor in my sitting room uh, this evening who is exploring. Um, which is quite interesting. Um, don't mind if it explores in this room, but so long as it doesn't scratch the harp. So we shall see how that goes. It's been helping with my jigsaw. Oh, okay. Well, we'll, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Chapter eight: A mistake. Meantime, young Delvile failed not to honour Cecilia's introduction of him to Mr. Harrel by waiting upon that gentleman as soon as the ill effects of his accident at the Pantheon permitted him to leave his own house. Mr. Harrel though just going out when he called, was desirous of being upon good terms with his family, and therefore took him upstairs to present him to his lady, and invited him to tea and cards the next evening. Cecilia, who was with Mrs. Harrell, did not see him without emotion, which was not much lessened by the task of thanking him for his assistance at the Pantheon, and inquiring how he had himself fared. No sign, however, of emotion appeared in return, either when he first addressed or afterwards answered her, the look of solicitude with which she had been so much struck when they last parted was no longer discernible, and the voice of sensibility, which had removed all her doubts, was no longer to be heard. His general ease and natural gaiety were again unruffled, and though he had never seemed really indifferent to her, there was not the least appearance of any added partiality. Oh, the visitor has discovered a John Lewis <laughs> box. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, it seems happy. <clears throat> Cecilia felt an involuntary mortification as she observed this change. Yet, upon reflection, she still attributed his whole behaviour to his mistake with respect to her situation, and therefore was but the more gratified by the preference he occasionally betrayed. The invitation for the next evening was accepted and Cecilia for once felt no repugnance to joining the company. Young Delvile again was in excellent spirits, but though his chief pleasure was evidently derived from conversing with her, she had the vexation to observe that he seemed to think her the undoubted property of the baronet, always retreating when he approached, and as careful when next her to yield his place if he advanced, as when he was distant to guard it from all others. But when Sir Robert was employed at cards, all scruples ceasing, he neglected not to engross her almost wholly. He was eager to speak to her of the affairs of Mr. Belfield, which he told her wore now a better aspect. The latter, indeed, of recommendation which he had shown to her, had failed, as the nobleman to whom it was written had already entered into an engagement for his son, but he had made application elsewhere, which he believed he would be successful, and he had communicated his proceedings to Mr. Belfield, whose spirits he hoped would recover by this prospect of employment and advantage. It is, however, but too true, he added, that I have rather obtained his consent to the steps I am taking than his approbation of them. Nor do I believe, had I previously consulted him, I should have even that. Disappointed in his higher views, his spirit is broken, and he is heartless and hopeless, scarce condescending to accept relief from the bitter remembrance that he expected preferment. Time, however, will blunt this acute sensibility, and reflection will make him blush at this unreasonable delicacy but we must patiently soothe him till he is more himself, or while we mean to serve, we shall only torment him. Sickness, sorrow, and poverty have all fallen heavily upon him, and they have all fallen at once. We must not, therefore, wonder to find him intractable, when his mind is as much depressed as his body is elevated. I think my visitor has gone. I'm afraid that it is not... 
Yes, I think he. I think. I think he's gone. It seems that uh, Fanny Burney is not to its taste. Well, um, <clears throat> Cecilia, to whom his candour and generosity always gave fresh delight, strengthened his opinions by her concurrence, and confirmed his designs by the interest which he took in them. From this time, he found almost daily some occasion for calling in Portman Square. The application of Cecilia in favour of Mr Belfield gave him a right to communicate to her all his proceedings concerning him, and he had some letter to show, some new scheme to propose, some refusal to lament, or some hope to rejoice over, almost perpetually. Or even when these failed, Cecilia had a cold, which he came to inquire after, or Mrs Harrell gave him an invitation which rendered any excuse unnecessary. But though his intimacy with Cecilia was increased, Though his admiration of her was conspicuous, and his fondness for her society seemed to grow with the enjoyment of it, he yet never manifested any doubt of her engagement with the baronet, nor betrayed either intention or desire to supplant him. Cecilia, however, repined not much at the mistake, since she thought it might be instrumental to procuring her a more impartial acquaintance with his character than she could rationally expect, if, as she hoped, the explanation of his error should make him seek her good opinion with more study and design. To satisfy herself not only concerning the brother, but the sister, she again visited Miss Belfield, and had the pleasure of finding her in better spirits, and hearing that the noble friend of her brother, whom she had already mentioned, and whom Cecilia had before suspected to be young Delvile, had now pointed out to him a method of conduct by which his affairs might decently be retrieved, and himself creditably employed. Miss Belfield spoke of the plan with the highest satisfaction, Yet she acknowledged that her mother was extremely discontented with it, and that her brother himself was rather led by shame than inclination to its adoption. Yet he was evidently easier in his mind, though far from happy, and already so much better that Mr. Rupil said he would very soon be able to leave his room. Such was the quiet and contented situation of Cecilia, when one evening, which was destined for company, at home, while she was alone in the drawing-room, which Mrs. Harrell had just left to answer a note, Sir Robert Floyer accidentally came upstairs before the other gentleman. Ha! said he, the moment he saw her. At last I have the good fortune to meet with you alone. This, indeed, is a favour I thought I was always to be denied. He was then approaching her, but Cecilia, who shrunk involuntarily at the sight of him, was retreating hastily to quit the room, when suddenly recollecting that no better opportunity might ever offer for a final explanation with him, she irresolutely stopped, and Sir Robert, immediately following, took her hand and pressing it to her lips, as she, his lips as she endeavoured to withdraw it, exclaimed, "'You are a most charming creature!' when the door was opened and young Delvile at the same moment was announced and appeared. Cecilia, colouring violently and extremely chagrined, instantly disengaged herself from his hold. Delvile seemed uncertain whether he ought not to retire, which Sir Robert, perceiving, bowed to him with an air of mingled triumph and vexation, and said, Sir, you're most obedient. The doubt, however, in which every one appeared of what was next to be done, was immediately removed by the return of Mrs. Harrell, and the arrival at almost the same moment of more company. The rest of the evening was spent on the part of Cecilia most painfully. The explanation she had planned had ended in worse than nothing, for by suffering the baronet to detain her, she had rather shown a disposition to oblige than any intention to discard him, and the situation in which she had been surprised by young Delvile was the last to clear the suspicion she so little wished him to harbour, while, on his part, the accident seemed to occasion no other alteration than that of rendering him more than usually assiduous to give way to Sir Robert whenever he approached her. Nor was Sir Robert slack in taking advantage of this attention. He was highly in spirits, talked to her with more than common freedom, and wore the whole evening an air of exulting satisfaction. Cecilia, provoked by this presumption, hurt by the behaviour of young Delvile and mortified by the whole affair, determined to leave this mistake no longer in the power of accident, but to apply immediately to Mr Delvile Senior, and desire him as her guardian to wait upon Sir Robert himself, and acquaint him that his perseverance in pursuing her was both useless and offensive and by this method she hoped at once to disentangle herself for ever from the baronet, and to discover more fully the sentiments of young Delvile, for the provocation she had just endured robbed her of all patience in waiting for the advice of Mr Monckton. 
just want to pause a moment to say that I find it really charming the way they're presenting Cecilia and Delphi. Delphi is really growing on me. Um, his his desire to be with Cecilia, but his punctilious um, good breeding and um, reserve, not reserve in that he's clearly lively and, and good humoured, but reserve in that you've no idea what he, he really, he, he's, he's taking, he, he, he doesn't do anything that's inappropriate. He's, he's um, civil, civil, yes, civil and appropriate and he's not betraying himself too much. Um, it's just, it's just quite, 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 quite attractive, I suppose. Um, but it makes it hard for Cecilia because she, she's always, she's always wondering, does he like me? Does he not like me? Why does he behave like this? She's pretty sure of him, but she can't be totally sure of him. And, and they're playing this game of dancing around each other in a society where they can't be particularly open. I don't know. I just, I just find it's really, it's really nicely written and it's sort of, sort of understandable. I guess. I feel for them. Chapter 9. An Explanation. The following morning, therefore, Cecilia went early to St James's Square, and after the usual ceremonies of messages and long waiting, she was shown into an apartment where she found Mr Delvile and his son. She rejoiced to see them together, and determined to make known to them both the purpose of her visit. And therefore, after some apologies and a little hesitation, she told Mr. Delvile that, encouraged by his offers of serving her, she had taken the liberty to call upon her with a view to entreat his assistance. Young Delvile, immediately rising, would have quitted the room, but Cecilia, assuring him she rather desired what she had to say should be known than kept secret, begged that he would not disturb himself. Delvile, pleased with this permission to hear her, and curious to know what would follow, would very readily return to his seat. I should by no means, she continued, have thought of proclaiming even to the most intimate of my friends the partiality which Sir Robert Floyer has been pleased to show me, but he left to me the choice of publishing or concealing it, had he left to me the choice of publishing or concealing it. But on the contrary, his own behaviour seems intended not merely to display it, but to insinuate that it meets with my approbation. Mr Harrell also, urged by too much warmth of friendship, has encouraged this belief, nor indeed do I know at present where the mistake stops, nor what it, is, what it is report has not scrupled to affirm. But I think I ought no longer to neglect it, and therefore I have presumed to solicit your advice in what manner I most, may most effectually contradict it. The extreme surprise of young Delvile at this speech was not more evident than pleasant to Cecilia, to whom it accounted for all that had perplexed her in his conduct while it animated every expectation she wished to encourage. The behaviour of Mr Harrell, answered Mr Delvile, has by no means been such as to lead me to forget that his father was the son of a steward of Mr Grant, who lived in the neighbourhood of my friend and relation, the Duke of Derwent. Nor can I sufficiently congratulate myself that I've always declined acting with him. The late Dean, indeed, never committed so strange an impropriety as that of nominating Mr Harrell and Mr Briggs, coadjutors with Mr Delvile. The impropriety, however, though extremely offensive to me, has never obliterated from my mind the esteem I bore the Dean nor can I possibly give a greater proof of it than the readiness I have always shown to offer my counsel and instruction to his niece. Mr Harrell, therefore, ought certainly to have desired Sir Robert Floyer to acquaint me with his proposals before he gave to him any answer. Undoubtedly, sir, said Cecilia, willing to shorten this parading harangue, but as he neglected that intention, Will you think me too impertinent should I entreat the favour of you to speak with Sir Robert yourself, and explain to him the total inefficacy of his pursuit, since my determination against him is unalterable? Here the conference was interrupted by the entrance of a servant who said something to Mr Delvile, which occasioned him apologising to Cecilia for leaving her for a few moments, and ostentatiously assuring her that no business, however important, should prevent his thinking of her affairs or detain him from returning to her as soon as possible. 
The astonishment of young Delvile at the strength of her last expression kept him silent some time after his father left the room. But then, with a countenance that still marked his amazement, he said, Is it possible, Miss Beverley, that I should twice have been thus egregiously deceived? Or rather, that the whole town, and even the most intimate of your friends, should so unaccountably have persisted in a mistake? For the town, answered Cecilia, I know not how it can have had any concern in so small a matter, but for my intimate friends I have too few to make it probable they should ever have been so strangely misinformed. Pardon me, cried he, it was from one who ought to know that I had myself the intelligence. I entreat you then, said Cecilia, to acquaint me who it was. Mr. Harrell himself, who communicated it to a lady in my hearing and at a public place. Cecilia cast up her eyes in wonder and indignation at the proof so incontrovertible of his falsehood, but made not any answer. Even so, continued he, I can scarcely feel undeceived. Your engagement seems so positive, your connection so irretrievable, so, so fixed, I mean. He hesitated, a little embarrassed, but then suddenly exclaimed, Yet whence, if not neither favourable, if indifferent alike to Sir Robert and Belfield, whence that animated apprehension for their safety at the Opera House? Whence that never-to-be-forgotten, oh, stop him, good God, will nobody stop him? Words of anxiety so tender, and sounds that still vibrate in my ear. Cecilia, struck with amazement in her turn at the strength of his own expressions, blushed and for a few minutes hesitated how to answer him. But then, to leave nothing that related to so disagreeable a report in any doubt, she resolved to tell him ingenuously the circumstances that had occasioned her alarm, and therefore, though with some pain to her modesty, she confessed her fears that she had herself provoked the affront, though her only view had been to discountenance Sir Robert, without meaning to show any distinction to Mr. Belfield. Delvile, who seemed charmed with the candour of this explanation, said when she had finished it, You are then at liberty. Ah, oh, madam, how many may rue so dangerous a discovery? Could you think, said Cecilia, endeavouring to speak with her usual ease, that Sir Robert Floyer would be found so irresistible? Oh, no, cried he, far otherwise. A thousand times I have wondered at his happiness. A thousand times, when I have looked at you and listened to you, I have thought it impossible. Yet my authority seemed indisputable, and how was I to discredit what was not uttered as a conjecture, but asserted as a fact, asserted too by the guardian with whom you lived, and not hinted as a secret, but affirmed as a point settled? Yet surely, said Cecilia, you have heard me make use of expressions that could not but lead you to suppose there was some mistake, whatever might be the authority which had won your belief. No, answered he, I never supposed any mistake though sometimes I thought you repented your engagement. I concluded, indeed, you had been unwarily drawn in, and I have even at times been tempted to acknowledge my suspicions to you, state your independence, and exhort you, as a friend, exhort you, to use it with spirit, and if you were, if you were shackled unwillingly, incautiously or unworthily, to break the chains by which you were confined, and restore to yourself that freedom of choice upon the use of which all your happiness must ultimately depend. But I doubted if this were honourable to the baronet. And what indeed was my right to such a liberty? None that every man might not be proud of. I wish to do honour to myself under the officious pretence of serving the most amiable of women. Mr. Harrell, said Cecilia, has been so strangely bigoted to his friend, that in his eagerness to manifest his regard for him, he seems to have forgotten every other consideration. He would not else have spread so widely a report that could so ill stand inquiry. If Sir Robert, returned he, is himself deceived while he deceives others, who can forbear to pity him? For my own part, instead of repining that hitherto I have been mistaken, ought I not rather to bless an error that may have been my preservation, preservative from danger? Cecilia, distressed in what manner to support her part in the conversation, began now to wish the return of Mr. Delvile, and not knowing what else to say, she expressed her surprise at his long absence. It is not indeed well timed, said young Delvile, just now, at the moment when he stopped, and presently exclaiming, Oh, dangerous interval, he arose from his seat in manifest disorder. Cecilia rose too, and hastily ringing the bell, said, Mr. Delvile, I am sure, is detained, and therefore I will order my chair and call another time. Do I frighten you away? 
said he, assuming an appearance more fl placid. No, answered she, but I would not hasten Mr. Delvile. A servant then came and said the chair was ready. She would immediately have followed him, but young Delvile again speaking, she stopped a moment to hear him. I fear, said he with much hesitation. I have strangely exposed myself, and that you cannot, but the extreme astonishment. He stopped again in the utmost confusion, and then adding, You will permit me to attend you to the chair. He handed her downstairs, and in quitting her bowed without saying a word more. Cecilia, who was almost wholly indifferent to every part of the explanation, but that which had actually passed, was now in a state of felicity more delightful than any she had ever experienced. She had not a doubt remaining of her influence over the mind of young Delvile, and the surprise which had made him rather betray than express his regard was infinitely more flattering and satisfactory to her than any formal or direct declaration. She had now convinced him she was disengaged, and in return, though without seeming to intend it, he had convinced her of the deep interest which he took in the discovery. His perturbation, the words which escaped him, and his evident struggle to say no more, were proofs just such as she wished to receive of his partial admiration, since while they showed satisfied her heart, they also soothed her pride. By showing a diffidence of success, which assured her that her own secret was still sacred, and that no weakness or inadvertency on her part had robbed her of the power of mingling dignity with the frankness with which she meant to receive his addresses. All, therefore, that now employed her care was to keep off any indissoluble engagement, till each should be better known to the other. For this reserve, however, she had less immediate occasion than she expected. She saw no more of young Delvile that day, neither did he appear the next. The third she fully expected him, but still he came not. And while she wondered at an absence so uncommon, she received a note from Lord Ernolf, to beg permission to wait upon her for two minutes at any time she would appoint. She readily sent word that she should be at home for the rest of the day, as she wished much for an opportunity of immediately finishing every affair but one, and settling her mind at liberty to think only of that which she desired should prosper. Lord Ernolf was with her in half an hour. She found him sensible and well-bred, extremely desirous to promote her reliance with his son, and apparently as much pleased with herself as with her fortune. He acquainted her that he had been addressed that he had addressed himself to Mr. Harrell long since, but had been informed that she was actually engaged to Sir Robert Floyer. He should therefore have forborne taking up any part of her time, had he not the preceding day, while on a visit at Mr. Delvile's, been assured that Mr. Harrell was mistaken, and that she had not yet declared for anybody. He hoped, therefore, that she would allow his son the honour of waiting upon her, and permit him to talk with Mr. Briggs, who he understood was her acting guardian upon such matters as ought to be speedily adjusted. Cecilia thanked him for the honour he intended her, and confirmed the truth of the account he had heard in St. James's Square, but at the same time told him she must decline receiving any visits from his lordship's son, and entreated him to take no measure towards the promotion of an affair which could never succeed. He seemed much concerned at her answer, and endeavoured for some time to soften her, but found her so steady though civil in her refusal, that he was obliged, however unwillingly, to give up his attempt. Cecilia, when he was gone, reflected with much vexation on the readiness of the Delviles to encourage his visit. She considered, however, that the intelligence he had heard might possibly be gathered in general conversation, but she blamed herself that she had not led to some inquiry what part of the family he had seen, and who was present when the information was given him. Meanwhile, she found that neither coldness, distance, nor aversion were sufficient to repress Sir Robert Floyer, who continued to persecute her with as much confidence of success as could have arisen from the utmost encouragement. She again, though with much difficulty, contrived to speak with Mr. Harrell upon the subject, and openly accused him of spreading a report abroad, as well as countenancing an expectation at home, that had neither truth nor justice to support them. Mr. Harrell, with his usual levity and carelessness, laughed at the charge, but denied any belief in her displeasure, and affected to think she was merely playing the coquette, while Sir Robert was not the less her decided choice. Provoked and wearied, Cecilia resolved no longer to depend upon anybody but herself for the management of her own affairs, and therefore to conclude the business without any possibility of further cavilling, she wrote the following note to Sir Robert himself. To Sir Robert Floyer, Baronet. Miss Beverley presents her compliments to Sir Robert Floyer, 
and as she has had some reason to fear Mr. Harrell did not explicitly acquaint him with her answer to the commission with which he was entrusted, she thinks it necessary, in order to obviate any possible misunderstanding, to take this method of returning him thanks for the honour of his good opinion, but of begging at the same time that he would not lose a moment upon her account, as her thanks are all she can now, or ever, offer in return. Portman Square, May the 11th, 1779. To this note Cecilia received no answer, but she had the pleasure to observe that Sir Robert forbore his usual visit on the day she sent it, and though he appeared again the day following, he never spoke to her, and seemed sullen and out of humour. Yet still young Delvile came not, and still, as her surprise increased, her tranquillity was diminished. She could form no excuse for his delay, nor conjecture any reason for his absence. Every motive seemed to favour his seeking, and not one his shunning her. The explanation which had so lately passed had informed him he had no rival to fear, and the manner in which he had heard it assured her the information was not indifferent to him. Why, then, so assiduous in his visits when he thought her engaged, and so slack in all attendance when he knew she was at liberty? I think the answer might be in what the Delviles think for his future alliances and perhaps what he thinks he ought to think of his future alliances. It really is a case of Penelope and her suitors, is it not, yet again, and even Delvile sees her to an extent as an object to be disposed of. Ah, I'm reading 26 minutes, I wonder how long the next chapter is. Hmm. I think we should read the next chapter. It's the last one of volume two. Chapter 10. A Murmuring. Unable to relieve herself from this perplexity, Cecilia, to divert her chagrin, again visited Miss Belfield. She had then the pleasure to hear that her brother was much recovered, and had been able the preceding day to take an airing, which he had borne so well that Mr. Rupil had charged him to use the same exercise every morning. And will he? said Cecilia. No, madam, I'm sadly afraid not, she answered, for coach hire is very expensive, and we are willing now to save all we can in order to help him fitting help fitting him out for going abroad. Cecilia then earnestly entreated her to accept some assistance, but she assured her she did not dare without the consent of her mother, which, however, she undertook to obtain. The next day, when Cecilia called to hear her success, Mrs. Belfield, who hitherto had kept out of sight, made her appearance. She found her alike in person, manners and conversation, a coarse and ordinary woman, not more unlike her son in talents and acquired accomplishments, than dissimilar to her daughter in softness and natural delicacy. The moment Cecilia was seated, she began, without waiting for any ceremony or requiring any solicitation, abruptly to talk of her affairs and repiningly to relate her misfortunes. I find, madam, she said, you have been so kind as to visit my daughter Henny a great many times, but as I have no time for company, I have always kept out of the way, having other things to do than sit and talk. I have had a sad time of it here, ma'am, with my poor son's illness, having no conveniences about me, and much ado to make me mind me, for he's all for having his own way, poor dear soul, and I'm sure I don't know to contradict him, for it's not what I never had the heart to do. But then, ma'am, what is to come of it? You see how bad things go. For though I have got a very good income, it won't do for everything. And if it was so much again, I would want to save it all now. For here my poor son, you see, is reduced all in a minute, as one may say, from being one of the first gentlemen in town, to a mere poor object without a farthing in the world. He is, however, I hope now in much in better in health, said Cecilia. Yes, madam, thank heaven. For if he was worse, those might tell of it that would, for I am sure I should never live to hear of it. He has been the best son in the world, madam and use nothing, to the best, use nothing but the best company, for I spared neither pains nor cost to bring him up genteelly, and I believe there's not a nobleman in the land that looks more the gentleman. However, there's come no good of it, for though his acquaintances was among all, the fir all among the first quality, he never received the value of a penny from the best of them, so I have no great need to be proud. But I meant for the best, though I have often enough wished I had not meddled in the matter, but left him to be brought up in the shop as his father was before him. 
His present plan, however, said Cecilia, will I hope make you ample amends both for your sufferings and your tenderness. What, madam, when he's going to leave me and settle in foreign parts? If you were a mother yourself, madam, you would not think that such good amends. Settle, said Cecilia. No, he goes only for a year or two. That's more than I can say, madam, or anybody else. And nobody knows what may happen in that time. And how I shall keep up myself when he's beyond seas, I am sure I don't know. For he has always been the pride of my life, and every penny I saved for him, I thought to have been paid in pounds. You will still have your daughter, and she seems so amiable that I am sure you can want no consolation she will not endeavour to give you. But what is a daughter, madam, to such a son as mine? A son that I thought to have seen living like a prince, and sending his own coach for me to dine with him. And now he's going to be go taken away from me, and nobody knows if I shall live till he comes back. But I may thank myself, for if I had but been content to see him brought up in the shop, yet all the world would have cried shame upon it, for when he was quite a child in arms, the people used all to say he was born to be a gentleman, and would live to make many a fine lady's heart ache. If he can but make your heart easy, said Cecilia, smiling, we will not grieve that the fine ladies should escape the prophecy. Oh, ma'am, I don't mean by that to say he has been over gay among the ladies, for it's a thing I never heard of him. And I dare say if any lady was to take a fancy to him, she'd find there was not a modester young man in the world. But you must needs think what a hardship it is to me to have him turn out so unlucky, after all I have done for him, when I thought to have seen him at the top of the tree, as one may say. He will yet, I hope, said Cecilia, make you rejoice in all your kindness to him. His health is already returning, and his affairs were again a more prosperous aspect. But do you suppose, ma'am, that having, having him sent two or three hundred miles away from me, with some young master to take care of, is the way to make up to me what I have gone through for him? Why, I used to deny myself everything in the world in order to save money to buy him smart clothes, and let him go to the opera and Vanilla and such sort of places, that he might keep himself in fortune's way. And now you see the end of it. Here he is, in a shabby little room up two pairs of stairs, with not one of the great folks coming near him, to see if he's so much as dead or alive. I do not wonder, said Cecilia, that you resent their showing so little gratitude for the pleasure and entertainment they have formerly received from him. But comfort yourself that it will at least secure you from any similar disappointment, as Mr Belfield will in future be guarded from forming such precarious expectations. But what good will that do me, ma'am? For all the money has been thrown away after them, all this while. Do you think I would have scraped it up for him, and gone without everything in the world to see it all end up in this manner? Why, he might as well have been brought up the commonest journeyman, for any comfort I shall have of him at this rate. And suppose he should be drowned in going beyond seas, what am I to do then? You must not, said Cecilia, indulge such fears. I doubt not, but your son will return well, and return all that you wish. Nobody knows that, ma'am, and the only way to be certain is for him not to go at all. And I'm surprised, ma'am, you can wish him to make such a journey to nobody knows where, with nothing but a young master, that he must as good as teach his ABC all the way they go. Certainly, said Cecilia, amazed at this accusation. I should not wish him to go abroad if anything more eligible could be done by his remaining in England. But as no prospect of that sort seems before him, you must endeavour to reconcile yourself to parting with him. Yes, but how am I to do that, when I don't know if I ever shall see him again? Who could have thought of his living so among great folks, and then coming to want? I'm sure I thought they'd have provided for him like a son of their own, for he used to go about to all the public places just as they did themselves. Day after day I used to be counting for when he would come tell me he'd got a place at court, or something of that sort, for I never could tell what it would be. And then the next news I heard was that he was shut up in this poor bit of a place, with nobody troubling their heads about him. However, I'll never be persuaded but he might have done better, if he would have but spoken a good word for himself, or else have let me do it and done it for him. Instead of which, he never would so much as let me see any of his grand friends, though I would not have made the least scruple in the world to have asked them for anything he had a mind to. Cecilia again endeavoured to give her comfort, but finding her only satisfaction was to express her discontent, she arose to take leave. But turning first to Miss Belfield, contrived to make a private inquiry whether she might repeat her offer of assistance. A downcast and dejected look answering in the affirmative, she put into her hand a ten-pound banknote, and wishing them good morning, hurried out of the room. Miss Belfield was running after her, 
but stopped by her mother who called out, what is it? How much is it? Let me look at it. And then following Cecilia herself, she thanked her aloud all the way downstairs for her genteelness, assuring her she would not fail, making no, it known to her son. Cecilia at this declaration turned back and exhorted her by no means to mention it, after which she got into her chair and returned home, pitying Miss Belfield for the unjust partiality shown to her brother and excusing the proud shame he had manifested of his relations from the vulgarity and selfishness of her who was at the head of them. Almost a fortnight had now elapsed since her explanation with young Delvile, yet not once had he been in Portman Square, though in the fortnight which had preceded, scarce a day had passed which had not afforded him some pretence for calling there. At length a note arrived from Mrs Delvile. It contained the most flattering reproaches for her long absence, and a pressing invitation that she would dine and spend the next day with her. Cecilia, who had merely denied herself the pleasure of this visit from an apprehension of seeming too desirous of keeping up the connection, now from the same sense of propriety determined upon making it, wishing equally to avoid all appearance of consciousness, either by seeking or avoiding the intimacy of the family. Not a little was her anxiety to know in what manner young Delvile would receive her, whether he would be grave or gay, agitated as during their last conversation, or easy, as in the meetings which had preceded it. She found Mrs. Delvile, however, alone, and extremely kind to her, yet much surprised and half displeased that she had been so long absent. Cecilia, though somewhat distressed what excuses to offer, was happy to find herself so highly in favour, and not very reluctant to promise more frequent visits in future. They were then summoned to dinner, but still no young Delvile was visible. They were joined only by his father, and she found that no one else was expected. Her astonishment now was greater than ever, and she could account by no possible conjecture for a conduct so extraordinary. Hitherto, whenever she had visited in St James's Square by appointment, the air with which he had received her constantly announced that he had impatiently waited her arrival, he had given up other engagements to stay with her, he had openly expressed his hopes that she would never be long absent, and seemed to take a pleasure in her society to which every other was inferior. And now how striking the difference! He forbore all visits at the house where she resided. He even flew from his own when he knew she was approaching it. Nor was this the only vexation of which this day was productive. Mr Delvile, when the servants were withdrawn after dinner, expressed some concern that he had been called from her during their last conversation, and added that he would take the present opportunity to talk with her upon some matters of importance. He then began the usual parading prelude, which upon all occasions he thought necessary, in order to enhance the value of his interposition, reminded her of her inferiority, and impressed her with a deeper sense of the honour which his guardianship concur conferred upon her, after which he proceeded to make a formal inquiry whether she had positively dismissed Sir Robert Floyer. She assured him she had. "'I understood, my Lord Ernolf,' said he, "'that you had totally discouraged the addresses of his son.' "'Yes, sir,' answered Cecilia. For I never mean to receive them. Have you, then, any other engagement? No, sir, cried she, colouring between shame and displeasure. None at all. This is a very extraordinary circumstance, replied he. The son of an earl to be rejected by a young woman of no family, and yet no reason assigned for it. This contemptuous speech so cruelly shocked Cecilia that though he continued to harangue her for a great part of the afternoon, she only answered him when compelled by some question, and was so evidently discomposed that Mrs Delvile, who perceived her uneasiness with much concern, redoubled her civilities and caresses, and used every method in her power to oblige and enliven her. Cecilia was not ungrateful for her care, and showed her sense of it by added respect and attention, but her mind was disturbed and she quitted the house as soon as she was able. Mr. Delvile's speech, from her previous knowledge of the extreme haughtiness of his character, would not have occasioned her the smallest emotion, had it merely related to him or to herself. But as it concerned Lord Ernolf, she regarded it as also concerning his son, and she found that far from trying to promote the union Mr. Monckton had told her he had planned, he did not seem even to think of it, but on the contrary proposed and seconded with all his interest another alliance. This, added to the behaviour of young Delvile, made her suspect that some engagement was in agitation on his own part, 
and that while she thought him so sedulous only to avoid her, he was simply occupied in seeking another. This painful suggestion, which everything seemed to confirm, again overset all her schemes and destroyed all her visionary happiness. Yet how to reconcile it with what had passed at their last meeting she knew not. She had then every reason to believe that his heart was in her power, and that courage or an opportunity more seasonable was all he wanted to make known his devotion to her. Why then shun if he loved her? Why, if he loved her not, seemed so perturbed at the explanation of her independence? A very little time, however, she hoped would unravel this mystery. In two days the entertainment which Mr. Harold had planned to deceive the world by an appearance of affluence to which he had lost all title was to take place. Young Delvile, in common with every other person who had ever been seen at the house, had early received an invitation, which he had readily promised to accept some time before the conversation that seemed the period of their acquaintance had passed. Should he, after being so long engaged, fail to keep his appointment, she could no longer have any doubt at the justice of her conjecture. Should he, on the contrary, again appear, from his behaviour and his looks she might perhaps be able to gather why he had been so long absent. End of the second volume. Have a good evening.